Amen. Amen. High five your neighbor and say, neighbor, you are not alone tonight. (laughs) So like I said, we're doing book of Daniel. We're doing the book of Daniel. And I have the privilege of doing part six. And part number one, we had Pastor Jenny who spoke about the fact that Jesus came full of grace and truth. Part number two, Pastor Greg spoke about how we can navigate and see the marks of a culture that is shifting. Part number three, Pastor Andre spoke about the fact that he has the whole world. In his hands. And in part number four, look at everybody trying to sing with me. Thank you so much for making sure I'm not alone. Part number four, Pastor Johnny spoke about the fire inside. Come on. The fire on the inside has to be greater than the fire on the outside. And then Teacher Paul spoke about how we can restore and regain and keep our sanity. Tonight, I'm super excited for the chapter of Daniel that we're going to go through. And for those of you perhaps who have not been part of this series, it's very simple. The context that we find the children of Israel in right now is that they are taken as slaves in Babylon. The reason that they are there is because they constantly rejected God. If you read your Old Testament, you'll see God constantly telling them, hey, listen, do not do that. And then they keep doing it. Do not do that. Then they keep doing it. Do not do it. Then they keep doing it. And eventually, they're taken into slavery. They're taken into slavery by Nebuchadnezzar, and they are now... In Babylon. While they're in Babylon, we've gone through different stories in the book of Daniel, and the first six chapters are really stories that actually happened. The next six after this will be prophecies. But we can use the first six chapters and the first six stories and accounts to really help us navigate our culture today. Because just like their culture, which was Babylon, It feels oftentimes that we're living in the same place. And the four Hebrew boys that many of the speakers have spoken about, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those four boys really show us how we can stand firm in our faith in a world that seems like Babylon. But not only that, they also taught us that we can stand firm in our faith and also have influence. So tonight we're going to see how one of those four Hebrew boys continues to do that. The problem, perhaps, in the world we live in today is that there's two extremes in the Christian world. The first extreme is all the people that says, we're right, you're wrong, if you don't like it, jog on. And the thing is, sometimes those people are right, but they're not effective. And here's the thing, Christian, God called us to be effective, not just right. You may feel like you are right on your Facebook page, but you are not effective. You can catch way more bees with honey than you can with vinegar. (laughs) God called us to be effective, not just right. However, on the other side, the second extreme is that you have people that forsake the truths of Scripture in order to have influence. So they dance around with the world. They dance around with culture. And the reason that they do it is so that they can win them over. But what we've seen over and over again with every celebrity that professes to be a Christian and then two weeks later on their Instagram page have shown you who they truly are is that you can't dance with the worldly things. That is not how you get influence. However, if we do it God's way, come on, somebody says, I will do it God's way, you will see that you will have both influence and you'll be able to stand firm. Pastor Jenny spoke about the fact that Jesus came full of grace and truth. There's a way for us to do it. I understand that culture is very difficult. It's disconcerting. It looks like culture is sliding. It looks like it's getting more and more gray every day. But tonight, I believe that as we read out of the fifth chapter of Daniel, we're going to be encouraged. So in Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, let's all read together. It's quite a bit, so just follow me. It says, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. 
So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. As they drank wine, they praised the gods of gold, of silver, and of bronze. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold, of silver, and of bronze. There's an Olympics joke right there, but I'm not going to make it. I will not make it. Of silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human man or hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal place. The king watched as the hand wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so scared that his knees had fellowship. His legs gave way, and he collapsed. The king called out to the enchanters, the astrologers, the diviners, to be brought in and said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That's often what the world does. They go off and they party and they drink wine and they make fun of the Christians at the Olympics and then they get into trouble. And then they can't figure out why the economies are dying. They can't figure out why there's rampant poverty in their cities. They can't figure out why the youth are committing suicide. They can't figure out why it is that society looks the way it does. And all of a sudden, they start to ask questions. They bring in all the thought leaders on podcasts to try and figure out why. It's actually more theological than that. In fact, perhaps I listened to another podcast the other day, and they said, actually, the Bible's not really true. All the people that wrote it were just high on drugs. That is the kind of justification that they make just so that they don't have to say, perhaps we should follow God. Perhaps we were better off when we followed God. And here's the thing, eventually when it gets really bad, they call on us. They call on people that are full of God. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, stay ready. You see, the world will take what is sacred and commit sacrilege with it. And because they do that, the writing is on the wall. The writing is on the wall for certain countries. The writing is on the wall for certain governments. The writing is on the wall for, for certain schools and educational departments that are looking to take God out of school, but the schools are getting worse. The writing is on the wall. There's writing on the wall, and nobody could interpret it. We've taken prayer out of schools. Why are the kids shooting each other? We've taken prayer out of schools. Why are the kids coming high at 8 o'clock in the morning? We've taken prayer out of the schools. Why are the kids fighting the teachers? I've seen videos of 13-year-olds swinging at their teachers. And they wonder why. But the writing's on the wall. Say, neighbor, the writing is on the wall. So the queen remembered, wait a minute, there's this guy named Daniel. I remember him because he interpreted your father's dreams. Nebuchadnezzar. So why don't we bring him in and perhaps he could interpret this writing that is on the wall. You see, society won't have the answers, church. And they're going to come looking for people that are full of God. And when they come knocking, dear Christian, please help me. What will you say? Will you send them a link to a TikTok video of a pastor who encourages you? Will you send them a link to BibleHub.com? Or do you have the word inside of you already to say, hey, my friend, I know that perhaps things are going crazy, but you have the mind of Christ. You don't have the anxiety that they've just put on you at your school. The Lord has given you a spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. That is who you are, neighbor. Is that what you're going to say in response when they come to you? But you can only respond that way if you're full of God. And so when we listen to messages like Vision Sunday, and Pastor Johnny's like, hey, listen, join Bible college. It's a soft sell. Join Bible college. For the Bible college students that are in here right now, that are successful in every single thing that they do, it's not a soft sell. Bible college saves some of our lives. Bible college saves some of our marriages. And so when Pastor Johnny says, hey, you might want to do Bible college, it's because you're going to get into a jam one day. You're going to get into a fight with your wife that might mark the end of it. But because you're skilled, because you have the tools, because you have the Word of God inside of you, you'll be able to overcome that issue. Some of you are in places of influence. 
You studied for four years, you're in the finance industry and you're doing very, very well. But there will come a time where they will ask you to do something that goes against the word of God. What will you say? Say, neighbor, stay ready. Look at your other neighbor and say, other neighbor, stay ready. You see, they're going to get desperate. It happened in the Euros a few years ago, the Euro soccer final, where Christian Eriksen collapsed on the field. That same stadium that was full of people that were cheering went deathly still. Nobody said anything. The other players huddled around Christian Eriksen. They had to hold his tongue so that he wouldn't swallow it while we watched on live TV. The commentators that were screaming goal and offside and all these things became somber. And all of a sudden, the world went quiet. Christian Eriksen survived. He ends up in hospital. And now all the secular organizations suddenly believe in prayer. So much so that Manchester United, the Red Devils, tweeted, our thoughts and our prayers are with Christian Eriksen. It can get so bad that even the devils are starting to ask for prayer. Christian, stay ready. Stay ready. They're getting desperate. So in your office, in your school, in your college, what will you say when they come to you? So she says, bring Daniel. Bring Daniel. Even though we don't agree with his God, bring Daniel. Verse 13, so Daniel was brought before the king. And the king said to him, are you, Daniel, one of the exiles my father, the king, brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you. And that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. What a thing to say of Christians, that we would be known as the people that have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. Because we finished Bible college. Come on, somebody. The wise men and enchanters <laughs> were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means. But they could not explain it. Now I've heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. Woo! I'm able to solve difficult problems. That's who I am. When you wake up in the morning, you say, Lord, as I go to my school, as I go to my workplace, I am able to solve difficult problems. Lord, I'm a key. And the thing about a key is that it is rigid, but it's rigid so that it can unlock big doors. So you think to yourself, Lord, I've, I've been chastised a little bit. You've hurt me a little bit. I feel like I'm not perfect, but it doesn't take a perfect shaped key to open a very big door. Christians, stay ready. I apologize. <laughs> if you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain. That's what they'll do. Hey, listen, I want to put something around your neck just to keep you a little bit closer. And you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. What you see there is that he can't even describe who Daniel is. He just says, there's something about you. Has, has any of your friends ever said to you, like, there's something different about you? I don't know what that is. Pastor Johnny spoke about it this morning out of Isaiah. You are anointed. Say, I am anointed. So when people are saying that, hey, there's something different about you, it's the power of God that is on the inside of you, Christian. And, and this is what Daniel said. Daniel basically said, hey, listen, that's cool. You can keep all your stuff. Let me give you a prophetic warning. In verse 23, he says, instead... You have set up for yourself. You have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you. And you and your nobles, your wives, your concubines, you drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and of gold and of bronze and of iron, wood and stone, which, can, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his life, in his hand, your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. When the world comes to you, church, to ask you these questions, it's important that you redirect them. Don't make it about the fluff. Don't make it about the Last Supper thing that you saw. Tell them you're not dealing with earthly things. This is not a joke. You are dealing with the Lord of heaven who holds your life in his hand. Be careful with the things you make jokes about. That's what you need to tell them. You need to redirect them. You need to be like, it's the Lord of heaven. It's, the, it's our God, the God who gave you the breath, the breath that you're singing all those sacrilegious songs with. That God is the God that you are blaspheming. Be careful. Be careful. Redirect them to eternal things. He says you don't realize who you're dealing with. 
So he says, let me give you the interpretation. And you can write these down. They'll also be in your notes. The inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel Parson. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Family of God, our days are numbered. I know this isn't the most encouraging passage of Scripture. It's only discouraging to those who don't know what's on the other side. Hebrews 9.27 says, just as people are destined to die once. Be very careful that you think that you're just going to live on earth forever. Don't be like the philosopher Drake who says, I'm not here for a long time, just a good time. No, 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 my friend. You are here for a very long time. You get to determine whether it's good or bad based on how you act here on earth. Say, stay ready. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. There's going to be a moment where your life is weighed, child of God. A better word might be judged. Our lives will be weighed. Whether you like it or not, you're going to stand before God and be judged. And he will ask you, I gave you my son, Jesus Christ. What did you do with that gift? And you might respond, I sang songs about him. I read his cool book and I listened to some of his cool tracks. That's not going to be good enough. The response he'll be looking for is that he was my personal Lord and Savior. I gave him everything I had while I was on the earth. I made sure I didn't just store up treasure here on earth, but I stored up treasure in heaven, Lord. I loved your son. I didn't just say that I loved him on my bio on Instagram. I had a personal relationship with God. Parson means your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Everything you've built and everything you've accumulated and all the hard work you've done your whole life, guess what? It's going to be divided, Belshazzar, and given to somebody else. Our earthly things will be given to someone else. I heard a preacher say that I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. I've never seen a hearse pulling a trailer that's got your cool sneakers, that's got your cool Apple Watch, that's got your Apple uh, phone 15. It's not going to happen. You're not taking that stuff to heaven. You're not taking that stuff to heaven. Say, neighbor, stay ready. You see, earth can't have its effects on you like everybody else when you know where you're going. So he tells him, he says, the Lord of heaven is watching you, Belshazzar. Your days are numbered. Your life is going to be weighed, and your kingdom is going to be given to somebody else. In verse 29, then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. He died that night. It can happen that quickly. People are saying things. People are tweeting things. People are TikToking things like they can't die just like that. Whew. He said he was slain and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. So this morning I said that I'd be discussing cancel culture just a little bit and I will. It's this pervasive idea, this prevailing idea that's taken over our society. It's basically just the practice of publicly rejecting people groups or various other groups for their views. Sadly, it's crept into the church. Sadly, Christians now cancel other Christians. Sadly, we don't understand that that very concept of cancel culture is a worldly concept. And because you think you're of this world, you begin to act like it. So you feel justified. You feel so justified when you post your Facebook post about what that pastor did, that prophet did, this evangelist did, that band did. You feel it in your flesh. It has nothing to do with God. And so you think that you can cancel people when Jesus never canceled you. There's entire YouTube industrial complexes where people are making money. They're putting ads on the videos that you're watching about Pastor A and Pastor B. Jesus never canceled you. Jesus called the canceled his friends, the drunkards, the prostitutes, the thieves. He called those people his friends. What society think are the worst of the worst, he befriended them. And yet you think, can you imagine if Jesus decided, you know what? No, I can't use Theo Volmerans. He used to own nightclubs. Because you see, while the world refuses to forget Jesus refuses to remember. 
It says in Psalm 103 verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, he has removed our transgressions from us. Jesus did cancel one thing just by the way. Colossians 2 verse 14 says, he forgave all our sins, having canceled the charge of legal indebtedness which stood against us. Be careful who you cancel, Christian. So we post TikToks. We share them. Hey, let me tell you about this, let me tell you about this guy, this pastor, this prophet. And we feel emboldened in our flesh to do that. As if, as if Peter wasn't someone who was cancelable. As if Paul was not somebody who was cancelable. Who are you? The next time somebody sends you a little TikTok video link or whatever, ask them what their favorite scripture is. Chances are they'll probably not have one. Because that's who you're listening to, Christian. You don't even know if that person that made that TikTok goes to church. You don't even know if they're Christian. They could just be making it just to cause division within the body. And you are now one of his henchmen walking into everybody's WhatsApp groups. Hey, let me show you what this pastor did. Instead of going into those WhatsApp groups and telling them about Jesus. Since when do we get to cancel people when Jesus never canceled us? Where would we be? Where would we be? If he decided, you know what, there's a perfect standard, there's a gold standard, and if you don't meet it, you are out. But we've decided that we can do that with people. Are you full of God? Or are you full of the world? You see, the hope of cancel culture is that we'll take something away from you. We'll take earthly things away from you so that you'll cave. But if I'm not of this world, you can take whatever you want. I'm going to preach Jesus every single day. I don't care if you don't like me. I don't care if you decide to cancel me. I'm choosing God. Say, neighbor, stay ready. The truth of the matter is that we are not of this world. Jesus would have put it this way in John 15 verse 19. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. So if the world loves you, <laughs> do you perhaps belong to them? As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. If you belong to the world, then the world would love you. So Jesus prays for his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane in John 17, and he says, I have given them your word. He's telling God the Father, I have given them your world, your word, and the world hates them because of it. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is that you do not take them out of this world, but protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world as I am not of it. Jesus is saying, Father, I've given them your word. I've given them a countercultural principle. And because I've given them your word, because they are preaching your word, because they're going to go out with your word, word the world is going to hate them. The world is going to reject them. And that's why this message title is not of this world. Say, neighbor, we are not of this world. You see, we have to live with an eternal perspective. Paul put it this way in Philippians 3, 18, For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says that the, the, their God is their stomach, meaning that feelings have become their God. And in the world that we live in today, we trust our feelings more than we trust the Word of God. So even if that video made you angry, you're going to trust that anger instead of the Word of God. You're going to trust that feeling and do something based on it instead of going back to the Word of God. To say, Lord, how do you feel about this? Lord, what have you said about the end times? Perhaps if we knew what would be coming, we wouldn't be that shocked when the world does it. I love that saying, by the way, on social media. Every time a South African does well, they say, no DNA, just RSA. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I wish I could say it, but I can't because I'm not of South Africa. I'm not of Zimbabwe. I'm not of America. I am a child of God. My home is in heaven. Our home is in heaven. 
No DNA, just RSA. Please, young people, come up with a cool one for heaven so I can post that one. <laughs> so if we are not of here, why do we put our stock here? Jesus said that this earth and everything in it is just a vapor. It's a blip on the screen of eternity. Jesus said, don't be afraid of the one who can kill your body. Instead, be afraid of the one that can throw your, bo your body and your soul into hellfire. In John chapter 14, when the disciples were worried, didn't know what was going to happen, Jesus com comforted them this way. He said, in my Father's house, there are many rooms, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. His solution to their problems here on earth was a heavenly home. And that's why I used to love listening to my parents sing hymns about heaven. So we have to live with a heavenly perspective. A Danish theologian by the name of Soren Kierkegaard from the 19th century said this, when the sailor is out at sea and everything is changing around him, as the waves are continually being born and dying, he does not stare into the depths of these, since they vary. He looks up at the stars, and why? Because they are faithful. As they stand now, they stood for the patriarchs and will stand for coming generations. By what means, then, does he conquer changing conditions? Through the eternal, by means of the eternal, one can conquer the future because the eternal is the foundation of the future. Say, neighbor, you can conquer your problems if you know that heaven is your home. So don't stare into the depths of the waves of this changing culture. Instead, look up at the stars because they are faithful. The problem is that if you don't know God, this, this is the best that it gets. This world is the best it'll ever get. But if you know God, it'll get so much better. So I'm going to give you three keys. Number one, go through life looking up and not around. Luke 21 verse 28 says, When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Be people who don't stare into things that are going to pass away anyway. We're going to focus on the eternal. We all know the scripture. It's a very famous scripture. We all love to quote it in Revelations 12 verse 11. It says, They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. But oftentimes we stop there and we don't read the rest. It says, They did not love their lives as much as to shrink from death. You see, they weren't intimidated by earthly things. I'm not intimidated by the world, everybody. I'm not intimidated by all these people that are trying their best to jar and to poke and to irritate us. That was Paul's attitude. Paul said, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Here's the thing. You can't threaten me with heaven. You can't threaten me with heaven. They were like, Paul, if you keep preaching Jesus, we're going to kill you. He was like, great. It's a win-win for me. I get to go early. I get to go be with Jesus early. You can't threaten a child of God with heaven. And you can't cancel a servant. Because point number two, servants focus their lives on the unseen and not the seen. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. Therefore, do not lose heart. That's for somebody here. I feel that there's somebody here who's dealing with fear, hectic fear. You don't know what to do anymore. Do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but the unseen is eternal. You have to live with an eternal heavenly perspective, Christian. And that's why we encourage you to join Dream Team. Like Pastor Johnny said this morning, it's not because we need you. I guess the staff could do it. We'll do an okay job. <laughs> High-fiving people. We'll have to run around because there's only like 100 of us. But the reason why we invite you to do that is so that you don't have to focus on your problems. You can fo focus on something that is bigger than your problems. 
You can focus on an et eternal glory when you are out there smiling at people, when you're a dream team and taking photos of people in praise and worship, you can achieve an et eternal glory of going, you know what, I made a difference this Sunday. You know what, I changed somebody's life. You know what, I paid for somebody's groceries and that person is going to be better off and now they know the love of Jesus because it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. You can't cancel a servant. Charles Finney, the great revivalist, was disowned by his pastor. Can you name that pastor? Charles Spurgeon was voted out of the Baptist Association. There was only seven people, only seven people out of that whole association voted for him. Can you name one? Martin Luther was persecuted by the Pope of Rome. Do you even know which Pope? The Apostle Paul was killed by, uh, by Nero in Rome. And now, 2,000 years later, people name their sons Paul and their dogs Nero. You can't cancel a servant. You can't cancel a child of God. As long as I keep serving, as long as I keep being in the house of God, as long as my eternal glory is right on the inside, I know that I can go out. And those people that say that they hate me because of how I am, they don't like the fact that I pray loud. They don't like the fact that I pray for my food in my cubicle. Well, guess what, child of God? It doesn't matter. In eternity, you have done well because that's what God has called you to, to be a child of God and not a child of this earth. And perhaps that's why. Maybe we're bored. Maybe Christians are just bored sitting at home on their phones. Because I often wonder, where do those people that continue to cancel people, which church do they go to? Because let me tell you something. No one wants to be in church with somebody like that. Because if I saw on YouTube that you canceled Stephen Fettig, if I see you in church, I'm going to ask security to get you out. <laughs> I'm kidding. But can you imagine... Can you imagine being somebody who spends all their days pointing out the wrongs of others, sitting in an actual church? You can't because when you're in church, you're with people that love you. When you're in church, you're with people that say, hey man, I know you're going through a tough time. Come, let me help you. In church, you're with people who say, I know that perhaps you might have smoked on the outside before you came in, but we're just glad you're here. Hey, in church, we know that you might have been at the club on Friday night, but you went to youth anyway. Hey, we love you, brother. Come back again. In church, we don't cancel people. In church, we embrace people. And so I have to think that those people that are making those posts, those people that are in those comments, fighting every single day to prove a point, are probably not serving anywhere. They're just sitting at home. While we are at church right now, they're busy tweeting. There's this pastor on YouTube at Christian Family Church. He's telling us that we can't get them. They're doing it right now. And if you are, please come to church next week, Sunday. Come on, when you're in church, we don't cancel people. We bring people in. That's what we do. Because my question then is, if we're canceling everybody, when you do meet a sinner, what are you doing? What are you saying? Or are you telling them, hey, Jesus loves you. Hey, brother, I heard that your family is going through a tough time. Jesus loves you. Perhaps it's somebody who is a Christian and they've lost a father or a mother and you're seeing their Instagram posts and you're seeing them in places that they're not supposed to be and you're pointing fingers instead of saying, hey, I just want to tell you I'm praying for you. I know it's hard to lose a parent. And so I'm not going to take the time to judge you and talk about you behind you, your back. I'm actually going to pray for you. Perhaps there's many, too many Christians that are just pointing fingers at people we know that are supposed to be in these seats right now and they're not here. So instead, we just like the fact that on Friday night there was someone else and we said nothing. We just spoke to each other in small group. Did you see that they were at the club again? Did you see that they were drinking again on Sunday? Did you see that they were at Farmer's Market? Did you see that they went to Maverick City concert? We like to do that, but we don't go, let me pray for you, brother. Say, neighbor, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. <laughs> Point number three, we have to focus our hearts on faith and not fear. So I encourage you, come to church. And I'm not just talking about today. Tomorrow, open up your Bible. Read the Word of God. Maybe perhaps come to 21 days of prayer. Just come. Just come. Just come. We're not doing anything weird, I promise you. <laughs> We're just praying. 
Just come. Perhaps you're sitting and you say, Clive, but I don't really know how to pray. We're going to show you literally how to pray. Come to church tomorrow. Maybe open up your Bible and let God speak to you through His Word. Maybe put on a praise and worship song. Maybe a praise and worship song that somebody told you, don't listen to that song. But it was anointed when it was written. Do you know how many people's lives have been saved by Hillsong worship? Some of us that are sitting here, if it wasn't that Hillsong worship song, we would have never raised our hand. And now we're the ones that are like, how? Uh, uh, uh. Focus on your faith, child of God. Focus on your faith. Focus on your faith, not fear. You're probably screaming and shouting about the Olympics and all this stuff because you're actually scared. You're scared. I don't know what's happening. I don't know where the world is going. I don't know which school my child should go to. I'm scared. I'm scared. So all I can do is complain online. But you won't be scared when you're in the presence of God. You won't be scared when you're sanctified. You won't be scared as the word washes over you. When it gives you the type of boldness where you can go into places and tell them, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hey, teacher, I'm sorry. I know you want my kid to play on Sunday. We're not coming. We're actually going to go to church. Is it fine? Your teacher might say, no, uh, we need him to play on Sunday. Say, that's fine. Real Madrid will call him anyway. Manchester United will call him anyway. We're not going to play for Eden Glen High. We're going to go play for a bigger team. Come on, Christian. Don't let them scare you. Don't let them scare you. Be the kind of people that are bold in their faith, that will walk into the spaces and say, I serve the God of heaven. I'm not looking at the waves that are changing every single day. So I got a closing story. I love closing stories. We're not the only generation to be fearful and scared. About 79 years ago, the world was scared that another atomic bomb would drop after it happened in Japan. And so everybody was just talking about the atomic bomb. When is it going to drop? Who's it going to drop on? And so C.S. Lewis, who, by the way, I found out the other day, the C in C.S. Lewis is actually Clive. What an anointed man of God. Anyway, he wrote an article. He wrote an article in 1948, living in the atomic age. It's going to be up on the screen. And wherever you see atomic bomb, place whatever it is you're going through whether it's fear, whether it's cancel culture, maybe it's cancer in your body, place it right in there. It says, in one way, we think a great deal too much of cancel culture. How are we to live in a cancel culture age? I am tempted to reply, why? As you have lived in the 16th century where the plague visited London almost every year, or as you would have lived in the Viking age when the raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat, uh, throat any night, or indeed as you are already living in this age of cancer, of syphilis, the age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before cancel culture was invented, before cancer came into play, before abuse and all the things you're going through were in play. And quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of a painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made. And the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. Christians, the first thing we need to do is to pull ourselves together. If we are going to be destroyed by the atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint, not that one, over playing a game of darts, not huddle together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, but they need not dominate our minds. This world is not my home. I am going home. I am going home. You can't cancel me. You can't tell me that my child has to do that. I'm a child of God. I have eternity in mind. You may break our bodies, but you can't break our minds. 
you know who our Savior is? His name is Jesus. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. I'm not here forever. I'm not here forever. I'm going home. Say, neighbor, don't worry about it. We're going home. Our Savior is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Give Jesus praise. Hallelujah. This world is not our home. This world is not our home. That witch doctor that's been sent to your family. This world is not your home. Stop worrying so much. Some of you might have an eviction note on your door right now. This world is not your home. There are promises of God that can take you out of that situation like this. This world is not my home. I'm focused on the eternal. We're going to kill you. We're going to cancel you. Great, go ahead. It's a win-win. It's a win-win. I'm going home. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father God, we dedicate our lives to you tonight. We say, Lord, we're sorry. We repent for wherever we've become focused on the things of the world instead of being focused on eternal things. We understand that while the writing is on the wall, we have a responsibility to redirect culture, to redirect the world and tell them about the Lord of heaven. Give us that fire again. Father God, help us to invite people to church instead of just ch judging them on social media. Give us the, 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 the impetus. Give us the, the, the heart to begin to pray for people. Pray for people that might even hate us. We declare that we are children of God. In Jesus' name, with every head still bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and you say, Clive, I want to know that heaven is my home. If that is you, I don't want to belabor this too long. If you want to say, Jesus, please be my savior, be my Lord and my friend. I want to have what those people have. Raise your hand right now. I'm not going to count too long. Wherever you are, raise your hand. You know your heart is beating right now. You know that you've been focused on things that you're not supposed to be focused on, but somebody invited you here. Just raise your hand wherever you are. I want to pray for you. You can make sure that you will have an eternal home. Come on, wherever you are, raise your hand online in the other venues you can have a guarantee tonight that you will go to heaven should you die you can have the confidence that the rest of us have if that is you don't miss this opportunity raise your hand right now one two three praise the lord once somebody has come and rested their hand on your shoulder you can put your hand down we're going to pray right now, and with this prayer, it will guarantee that heaven will be your home. Everybody say this together. Say, Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that I am a sinner, but I know that I have been saved by grace. Thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to die, and he was buried. But after three days, I acknowledge that he rose again. Say, Jesus make my heart your home I declare that I will never ever be the same again say this with faith say Lord I choose I to forgive those who have wronged me and hurt me I will walk in your freedom in Jesus name come on let's make some noise people are going oh come on CFC this is why we gathered Thank you for watching the Christian Family Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join our online community and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share this with your friends. Thank you again for watching and God bless you.